That, no, you're all right. Um, welcome everyone to World Affairs Fridays, sponsored by the Peoria Area World Affairs Council. The World Affairs Council is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing international, educational, and engaging programs to Central Illinois. For more than 50 years, PayWAC, as we are known among friends, has hosted experts to discuss key global events and issues and how they affect us locally. As a reminder, we are recording this today, so please mute yourself and use the chat function to submit your questions for um, Dr. Clymer to answer later. If time permits, you'll be invited to unmute and ask a question during the second half of the program. This week, we are honored to have Dr. Kenton Clymer with us to discuss Myanmar. Dr. Clymer recently retired as the Distinguished Research Professor in the Department of History at Northern Illinois University. Uh, he has taught students about U.S. relations with Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent since 2004 there. He is the author of several books on U.S.-Asian relations, including A Delicate Relationship, the United States and Burma, Myanmar, since 1945, published in 2015. In addition to several research trips to Asia, Professor Clymer has been a Wilson Center Scholar, 2011-2012, a Fulbright, Fulbright Lecturer at Renmin University of China in Beijing, and I understand that may be a, a, a gig that's continuing. Um, and he has a bachelor's from Grinnell College, um, Go Iowa, <laughs> and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Dr. Clymer, welcome. Thanks so much. Uh, I do appreciate being invited, and it's a pleasure and an honor to uh, be with you, even if it's by Zoom. Um, yeah, so I think this is uh, obviously a very uh, appropriate time to talk about what's going on in uh, Myanmar. Just uh, two days ago, uh, according to the UN uh, Special Representative for Myanmar, 38 people were killed by the military in an upsurge in the violence there. Uh, there's been somewhere between 54 and 100 uh, people killed uh, by the, in, in this uprising against the military junta. So it's a, it's a very, obviously a very important time to uh, give some focus to it. I, the New York Times gives almost daily focus to it, uh, publishing a major full page articles on it almost every day, it seems. Um, I want to start with a little history. I'm an historian and I do think particularly in this case, uh, the history, a brief overview of history will be useful in terms of putting what's happening now in, in perspective. Um, Burma was an independent kingdom uh, well into the 19th century when the first Americans had contact with uh, Burma. Um, it was independent. American merchant ships engaged in the trade with Asia, with India, with China would stop in Burmese ports from time to time. At one point, an American merchant ship, in fact, was commandeered by the king of uh, Burma to fight one of his uh, principalities. Um, so uh, it, it has a long history as an independent uh, country. But in the 19th century, over time, the British uh, began to take more and more control of it. There were three Anglo-Burmese wars in the 19th century, the first in 1824 to 1826, lopped off a chunk of Burma. Another chunk was absorbed in 1852, 1853. And the final Anglo-Burmese War was in 1885 to 1887, by which time uh, the British had complete control of the country and the monarchy was ended and Burma became part of British India. It was incorporated into British India, uh, getting a kind of a separate administration only in the 1930s. Uh, and so it became kind of a colony of a colony, if you will, a backwater in a way of the British Empire. Um, the British, of course, remained in charge of Burma then until World War II. World War II, the Japanese invaded and took over uh, Burma, um, which involved some American uh, troops fighting with the British troops uh, as they retreated uh, into India. And so Burma was then under a Japanese uh, control. But even before the Japanese had come, there had been an independence uh, movement in uh, Burma. And uh, this man here, uh, General An Sang, uh, was uh, the most important of the independence uh, leaders uh, going back to the 1930s, if not before. And 
Ansang led an army in Burma during World War II. In fact, he fought on the side of the Japanese. Oh. His army fought on the side of the Japanese, uh, not, I think, because he was particularly fond of the Japanese, but rather this was a way of getting the British out. But later in the war, he switched sides and uh, ended up fighting with the Allies uh, and helped to drive the Japanese out in the final months of the war. Um, and as the British decided that they had to give up uh, Burma, why um, it was clear that An Sang was going to be the first prime minister of Burma and was in effect uh, the prime minister of Burma in 1947, even though Burma did not become independent until January 4th, 1948. But tragically, uh, in 1947, in the summer of 1947, An Sang was assassinated along with half of his cabinet. And that was a true tragedy for Burma because uh, as you may know, Burma is about a third of the population of Burma are minority groups, various ethnic minorities who don't get along necessarily with the, with the uh, majority Burmans or Bamars as they're called. And uh, Ansang was one of the few Burmans who might well have been able to achieve a real union of Burma involving the minority groups as well. But he was assassinated uh, and um, Burma has yet to this day to become really a united country. There are civil wars going on in Burma right now um, of various minority groups, the Karens, the Kachins and others um, who are literally in battle from time to time against the central government of Burma. The longest civil wars really in, in the world uh, have you know, been going on since 1948, 49, 1950, up to the present time. Uh, and so it's a true tragedy that An Sang was, was uh, killed. But because he was, uh, the first prime minister of Burma was uh, Unu. He's pictured here with President Eisenhower in 1954, 55, giving a check to Eisenhower for $5,000. It's kind of a token note of appreciation for American involvement and soldiers who died in the liberation of Burma from the Japanese. But the point here is that from 1948 to 1958, uh, Burma was a genuine democracy, a troubled democracy, because it had a lot of these ethnic wars going on and a couple of communist uh, rebellions taking place. Uh, but uh, UNU was, uh, was the president and it was democratic um, until 1958. And then in 1958, uh, General Ne Win, who was the uh, Minister of Defense, mounted a, a kind of soft coup, a negotiated coup. The American ambassador called it a polite coup. Uh, in which uh, he took over from Ne Win, I mean from uh, Unu, uh, and uh, the military was in charge for about 18 months. Then he returned it, uh, returned Burma to civilian rule. Unu was overwhelmingly elected, uh, which bothered Ne Win because he didn't like Unu. Um, and then in 1962, Ne Win took over in a hard coup. And from then on, from 1962 for 50 years, the military ruled. Burma. Um, and so it was under military rule into the 21st uh, century. Um, the, um, but despite the, the uh, military's rule, there was one interruption in that, or an attempted interruption, and that was a revolution in 1988. Uh, it's called uh, 8888, August 8th, 1988. And this was when uh, the Burmese populace, led primarily by students, uh, rose up against the government of uh, Ne Win and the military. And the military responded with a great deal of violence. Thousands were killed, maybe 10,000 were killed, uh, hundreds arrested and imprisoned. Uh, among them, um, the student leader Minko Nai, the most famous of those that were detained probably. Uh, Minko Nai uh, spent 15 years in prison um, and uh, was very much of a democracy uh, activist. The, the other thing which is important about this rebellion is that out of it came uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Aung San Suu Kyi was, was the leader of the resistance to the Burmese military at this time. She 
is the daughter of An Sang, the George Washington of Burma. And that's one reason she accepted sort of the leadership of the resistance. She formed a political party called the National League for Democracy. She, it was almost entirely by accident. She actually lived in, in England. Uh, her husband was a, was a professor at Oxford, but she was back in, in Rangoon at the time of the rebellion. Uh, and she never left Burma after that until after democracy was restored in, in Burma. She was uh, the leader of the resistance um, and, um, and a very, very uh, powerful leader, uh, very eloquent in both Burmese and in English. Um, and so eventually she was uh, arrested by the Burmese and put under house arrest for 15 years as well. But interestingly, uh, early on, the military made, attempted to make some uh, compromises with the resistance, and they allowed an election to take place in 1990. No one in the world thought that this was going to be a free and fair election. But in fact, it turned out to be pretty fair, fair uh, and, and free. And in that election, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's party won 392 seats, and the military won 10. Uh, so it was really quite overwhelming. Uh, so the military just decided to ignore the results of the election. And that's when they put Aung San Suu Kyi under house arrest and governed as if there had not been an election. And they continued to, to, to rule uh, despite immense pressure from within because almost nobody in the country favored the military uh, and uh, immense pressure from abroad as uh, the United States, the European Union, um, the Japanese and others uh, began to try to pressure Burma, put sanctions on Burma. And, so, and in the 21st century, changes began to appear. Um, in 2010, uh, change was, was beginning to be evident. In 2012, um, they, uh, Minko Nai was freed and the National League for Democracy won uh, a by-election there were 45 parliamentary seats up for um, election, and Aung San Suu Kyi's party won 43 of the 45. The military accepted the results. And in 2015, there was a large election, a full election of the parliament. And once again, um, the NLD won um, most of the seats in parliament. And so, there was, there was a, a genuine democracy restored uh, after 2015. It was not, uh, it was a limited democracy. The military continued to retain considerable power, but it was a democratic institution. Aung San Suu Kyi was effectively in charge, although she was not the prime minister because of the Burmese constitution that did not allow her to become the prime minister, but in effect, she was in charge. And then in January 2020, just uh, uh, January 2021, pardon me, January 2021, there was another election. Uh, and this time again, uh, the National League for Democracy uh, won um, uh, overwhelmingly. Um, and then the military reverted to its historic despotic rule. Um, so uh, as I say, it's deja vu all over again the military is back in control. The person who led the insurgency, or led the, the, led the military junta, leads the military junta, is General Min An Hlaing. And so why did they act? Why did they act at this time? What did they hope to achieve? Well, I don't think anyone can speak definitively to that, uh, what their motivation was. But let me point out a few things here, which, which probably contributed or may have contributed to their thinking. First of all, the election results were embarrassing to the military. Uh, they probably, as in 1990, they probably hadn't expected to be defeated uh, so badly, but they were defeated pretty badly. Uh, the NLD won 396 seats, the military won 33. Um, but, the military still had a lot of power. Uh, the, the constitution of Burma that was imposed by the military in 2008 
uh, gives it 25% of the seats in, in Parliament, regardless of the election. The military controls the Department of Defense, the Department of, of, uh, of uh, the home, home Affairs, uh, among other things. They have significant uh, economic uh, power. Um, uh, but despite all of that, uh, they may have been just very deeply angered at the results of the election and decided that uh, this was the time to take over again. Uh, they claim fraud in the election. There's no evidence of fraud, uh, but um, they've chose to take over at this time. Another reason which has been advanced uh, is that the International Court of Justice of the United Nations, which is not to be confused with the International Criminal Court, uh, took a uh, or took under advisement a case got brought against Myanmar for genocide against the Rohingyas. You've perhaps heard of the Rohingyas, they're a Muslim minority, very persecuted minority, uh, and the military has moved against them brutally in, in recent years. And uh, a case was brought against them at the International Court of Justice for genocide. And while the court has not ruled definitively, as I understand it, uh, on this case. It has ordered uh, Myanmar to, to retain, uh, preserve evidence that they might have of genocidal acts and so forth. And so the military may have feared losing its impunity over the years uh, as, uh, and so that may have contributed to their desire to take over completely. A third factor uh, concerns um, specific military privileges. Um, uh, Ming Ang Lang is over the age when generals are supposed to retire. They're supposed to retire at 60. And in 2014, the, um, the military, I guess it was just the military, allowed him to extend his rule uh, into 2021, even though he's over the age, he wants to have that extended again. Aung San Suu Kyi has said no, that the government will not allow him to do that. Another thing apparently is that he wanted to be named president. Aung San Suu Kyi said no, he could not be named president. Um, and according to one thing I, I read, uh, she may have just told the military, well, uh, if you don't accept this, go ahead, have your coup. She may have known they were planning a coup. And so they went ahead and did the coup. So these are just suggested reasons. They're not definitive. Uh, more might come out in, in the future. So a few words about the response to this. Uh, the coup took place on February 1st, just very shortly before the new parliament was supposed to take its seats. Um, and there has been general resistance to it, of course. The same day as the coup, the Minister of Health resigned from the government. On this, the next day, uh, what was called the Civil Defense Movement broke out, uh, affecting many people in societies. Large protests broke out in major cities and have continued. They're really quite massive in, si in, in size. On February 4th, uh, the first secretary of the Myanmar Embassy in Washington uh, asked for political asylum in the United States. Um, many groups have gone out on strike, uh, uh, and I've got to, I've got a few pictures here of the of the resistance. Um, but medical doctors have refused to work in government hospitals. Garbage collectors have gone out. Electrical workers have gone out on strike. Um, According to one uh, estimate, roughly three quarters of Myanmar's civil service are on strike. Uh, there are boycotts of companies owned by the military, including boycott of Myanmar beer, which is a popular beer uh, apparently controlled by a military company uh, in Myanmar. Uh, gold and jewelry stores are controlled by the military, some of them are, and those are being boycotted. Electricity uh, customers are encouraged uh, not to pay their bills. A couple of other pictures here. I like this one. I don't know if you can read that or not. Uh, I hate military coup more than Manchester United. Uh, <laughs> 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 
here's another one. This is the, the Internal Revenue Department, uh, <clears throat> civil servants going out on strike, proclaiming that they're part of the civil disobedience movement. Um, so, uh, then finally, this happened just, uh, well, on February uh, 26th, not very long ago, the Burmese, uh, or the Myanmar representative at the United Nations uh, publicly urged the United Nations to take all measures necessary to thwart the military junta. So, of course, he was fired by the military government. And, uh, but the person that the military government appointed apparently also resigned, although not giving reasons why. So, in the course of all of this, of course, the the military has, has been attempting to thwart these various demonstrations. We've arrested uh, maybe as many as 1,500 people. They put, uh, they put uh, Aung San Suu Kyi back under a house arrest. They've been trying to arrest uh, various uh, academics. Um, there have been some resistance to it, to some of these arrests, uh, and sometimes they've not been successful. They attempted to uh, uh, raid the home of the rector of Mandalay University of Medicine, but um, they had to retreat in the face of angry responses from the neighbors and from the family uh, in, that, in that case. Uh, the, the response of the military uh, ha has been relatively restrained in the sense that uh, whereas they shot down thousands in 1988, um, there have been fewer casualties, at least so far. The first person shot was on February 6th, a young woman shot in, shot at the capital of uh, Napido. Uh, other persons have been shot now and the violence seems to be escalating escalating some. I think the military does understand the, the bad press, so to speak, if they get too violent, but there's always a fear that uh, they, they uh, will really, that there will be a real bloodbath uh, in, in Myanmar. Just a couple of observations on the nature of this resistance and how it differs somewhat from that of 1988. 1988 was an effort to get the military to hold elections and then to have them honor the results of the elections. And of course, they were very loyal to Aung San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy. Uh, this time we have a new generation. Um, and one thing that is important to realize, I think, is how, how late Myanmar came to the digital age. If you wanted to buy it, get a cell phone in Myanmar 10 years ago, it would cost you $2,000 to get a SIM card. Um, whereas in China, whereas in the rest of Asia, you know, for a little bit of nothing, you could get a SIM card. It was universal, but not in Burma. Uh, cell phones were limited to, the, to a very, very elite group. <clears throat> Excuse me. But then there was a revolution in Burma, and now everybody has cell phones. I think there are literally more cell phones in Burma than there are people in Burma. They all have cell phones that cost $1.50 for the SIM card, I think. Um, and of course, the internet came, and they all have internet, all had internet access, and they're all on Facebook. And it's much easier, for, and, and, and these are, many of these are young people, and this, they grew up with this, and this is a fundamental right to them, and they don't want to give that up. And so, and, and of course, it allows them to organize much more easily than you could organize back in 1988, when you had to use, uh, well, I don't know, handwritten notes and uh, things like that to organize. Uh, so it's, and, and their demands are a little different. Their demands are broader than simply support for Aung San Suu Kyi. They do want Aung San Suu Kyi to be released. They do want uh, the parliament that was elected to be seated. But they also want to have more far-reaching uh, changes. And in particular, they, they'd like to get rid of that constitution of 2008, or at least modify it, so the military doesn't have so much power. 
uh, there's also much more sympathy being expressed for some of the minority groups, which are also part of this uh, anti-government uh, demonstration. And rather surprisingly, there has been some support expressed for the Rohingyas. Uh, the Rohingyas uh, were not popular with many people in Burma at all, including former political prisoners uh, during the 1988 rebellion. But uh, there are now, there's now some expression of sympathy for them. And uh, the, uh, the uh, Rohingyas themselves have expressed support for this resistance to the military. So it's a, a kind of a different, <clears throat> a different uh, world. <coughs> Pardon me, excuse me different world, a different kind of protest, and we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the military <clears throat> is probably not going to be giving up easily, but the, 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 the protesters seem very determined, uh, very confident in their ability to face down the military, and it's just something that we'll have to watch and see what, uh, what happens out of it. So perhaps I'll, I'll stop at this point. I can tell you something about, if you wish, the American response to what's going on there, the response of China. But uh, why don't we just stop at this point if there's any questions or something else you wanna talk about. And I can, uh, I'll also, I think, uh, get rid of the slides if that seems appropriate at this point. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think, um, I think one of the first questions to ask is, what should the United States be doing about the current situation? Uh, the United States has condemned the action. Um, another thing that, uh, that uh, is, well, let me say what the United States has done specifically. They have uh, an executive order by President Biden has in, invoked some, some targeted sanctions they're, they're leery of general sanctions because that hurts the, the general population. They don't want that collateral damage. So they have inflicted some or imposed some targeted sanctions, sanctions at, at the military leadership, General Min An Long and five other people who were directly responsible for the coup have been uh, sanctioned. They can't access any funds they have in the United States, that sort of thing. There have been uh, sanctions against some uh, companies that are controlled by the military. Um, and the United States is also, uh, much, as you know, much more than the Trump administration, the, the Biden administration wants to act multilaterally. So it has been cooperating with the European Union, with the Japanese, with the British um, and others to try to you know, see if we're on the same page. Also working with ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which uh, Myanmar is a, is a party to. Um, so um, that's what uh, has been done. Um, there is, they've been uh, again uh, condemned verbally uh, after this latest attack, which resulted in the 36 of 38 people being killed. Uh, recently, uh, Secretary Blinken called it atrocious. So that's what's been done. Now, deliberately, apparently deliberately left other sanctions on the table. They have not sanctioned the entire <clears throat> Myanmar military. They have gone after some um, companies controlled by the military, but not all of them, including two very significant conglomerates that the military controls and which uh, General Min An Long has very significant interests in, financial interests in, uh, but they, I think they're holding back on that to, as a further warning to the military that uh, if they, uh, if there are no changes that more severe sanctions uh, could be uh, imposed. Do you now, think, I'm sorry, in your experience, do you think sanctions will be effective? I think uh, the general you are talking about was quoted just a couple days ago as saying, we are used to sanctions, we have survived them. Yes. So is there, is there more than sanctions? Is there something else we could be doing, we the United States? The sanctions issue uh, is, is a big question, of course. The United States doesn't have an awful lot of influence in Myanmar. Um, the, um, 
although with the opening up of the country in recent years, there have been more and more American firms that have invested and so forth. But uh, no one claims that the United States has an awful lot of direct influence. But this question of sanctions is a complicated one. Um, back in the days of the earlier revolution, the United States took its time in imposing sanctions, but um, beginning in 1997, almost a decade after the revolution, the United States began to impose serious sanctions as did uh, other countries in the European Union and so forth. And one of the arguments against those sanctions, and you see the same today, is that, well, if we sanction them, China will just uh, step in and, uh, you know, um, invest in, in Myanmar and so forth. Well, that was a complaint against the sanctions before. Even um, some Americans argued that the sanctions were self-defeating because they just turned everything over to China. And in a sense, that was right. They did turn everything over to China. Uh, China's trade just increased enormously uh, in those years, and they controlled a lot of uh, economic assets in the country and so forth. But what was the reaction to that? There was a nationalistic reaction against China. They don't like to be controlled by anybody. Uh, and I think, I think that one of the reasons that Burma did open up finally was because of their, their dependence on China and that they felt a need to open to the rest of the world. Now, I don't know if that applies in this case today. Um, and, and I wouldn't want it to take, you know, 25 or 30 years as it did before, <clears throat> before there has changed. On the other hand, China has been quite interesting in, in their response to this too. China has not unequivocally come down on the side of the military. Uh, their their, their, their uh, embassy in, uh, in Myanmar issued a statement saying they were neutral. And that's, I think, partly because they actually had very good relations with Aung San Suu Kyi. Aung San Suu Kyi went to China a number of occasions. Got very well. and, and furthermore, interestingly enough, the Burmese military does not have necessarily good feelings about China. Uh, a lot of those generals and, and high-ranking officials have shrapnel in them that is Chinese shrapnel back from the days when the Chinese were supporting Burmese communists. And even to this day, the Chinese are supporting some of the ethnic rebellions. Uh, so, you know, I, the, the China thing is, is really quite interesting. But I, I, your, your question about what the United States could do further, uh, whether it's, I don't know if targeted sanctions might work. Uh, some people have thought that they would, especially if they get at the Burmese military's economic holdings. If we could stop international transactions, for example, um, one, one suggestion was to, was to convince Belgium to get rid of the SWIFT uh, transaction. Do you know the SWIFT? If you, if you ever tried to transfer money from uh, a foreign country to the United States, you have to have a SWIFT number. I don't understand all of this. And apparently Belgium, for some reason, has that. If Belgium would cut that out, it would make it very difficult for them to, to um, you know, to, to transfer money, things like that. Uh, and another, another thing which has been suggested is the United States could encourage the Association of Southeast Asian countries to take action. Uh, the ASEAN doesn't normally <clears throat> interfere in these things too much, but already four countries in that grouping have, have, have spoken out against the military junta. Yeah, so. Some of, um, as I understand it, some of Myanmar's closest friends are in the neighborhood, India, China, um, Singapore, even Japan. Um, some of those are closer to the United States than others. Is this maybe a bargaining opportunity for the United States to change our dynamic with China to partner on a, a solution here in, in uh, Myanmar? Do you see anything of that possibility? I know you're going back to teach online uh, in China here. Um, what do you think about an angle of that nature? I hadn't really thought of that in that in that sense, um, except that it is possible that China um, might cooperate uh, on some economic sanctions. Um, if I, I've read anyway that if if the sanctions against major 
holdings of the military, if the sanctions include all of these things that go into the products that they manufacture, anything being made in Burma or, or uh, having a Burmese connection, were, were sanctions, the Chinese might possibly, you know, honor that. Um, but um, I, I don't know. I, I, <clears throat> I think it would take a lot to get Chinese to U.S. Cooper open cooperation. Okay. Um, I'm going to follow on and then I'll get to the questions in the chat here a little more in order. But one of the other folks in the chat asked about Russia's angle. So if the United States is not having great success in its, in its uh, Burma's typical friends or tra traditional friends aren't having success um, getting this uh, military coup and violence resolved, would you think that perhaps Russia could step in? Russia's kind of famous for poking its nose in to uh, you know, continue the havoc. <laughs> Do you, do you think Russia will be involved in Myanmar? There have been, um, I don't know how credible, reports that the Russians uh, have been involved in Myanmar's efforts to limit the internet. Um, China also, although I read today that there's no evidence that the Chinese have been involved yet. But uh, Burma has, I mean, they have a problem because whereas the people, of course, depend on the internet, so does the military. Um, and uh, the, the Burmese military has used uh, all sorts of new technologies to their advantage, having built up their capabilities during, even during these democratic years, perhaps in, in anticipation of some sort of coup. Uh, so the Russians uh, certainly would not be very helpful to the United States, I wouldn't think, or to those who are putting sanctions on, on Burma or trying to persuade Burma to change. Uh, they can, of course, play a spoiler role in the UN, too. Uh, if the UN wanted to impose uh, UN sanctions, the Russians could, could interfere. So I think, yes, they, they, they could and perhaps are uh, playing some role. How do the people in uh, Myanmar vote? What are, what's their electoral process like? How do we ensure that it's a fair and accurate election? Well, I think they, they, it seems to me they uh, vote, uh, maybe they get ink stands on their hand like some countries do, you know, showing they voted. Um, I, I think you can tell if it's free and fair if uh, the NLD wins, <laughs> probably, uh, and the military doesn't do well. But I think their process is, uh, I, I don't think it's an online process or anything like that. I think it's a, you know, regular going to the polls kind of, kind of process. How many major uh, ethnic groups do you find in Myanmar. There are 134 officially registered ethnic groups. How many? Uh, they, 134. Okay. Uh, the, the Rohingyas are not usually counted. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't recognize the Rohingyas as an ethnic group. I, I taught in Burma for a, a semester, for a, just a month back in 2013, I think, 12 or 13. And uh, I, I mentioned the Rohingyas once. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the students were mostly uh, younger history professors there, actually. And one of them came up afterwards to the office and, you know, said, you know, very emotionally and, and almost carefully, there are no Rohingyas. <coughs> they call them Bengalis. They're ben Bangladesh people. So... Is that is that you're not, not where, one of the official ethnic groups, but they certainly are one. Is that where the gap emerges that allows um, the the persecution of the Rohingya because we call them Bengalis? Uh, that that has certainly taken on, you know. On on that same trip, uh, we we were out in in Rakhine State, which is where the Rohingyas live. And the manager of the hotel was a very nice person, very nice to me. You know, told me that all the Bengalis were very happy they were in these detention camps and very happy and uh, being taken care of. So yeah, I think it has allowed them to, but the military has been very, very violent against them, of course, and go about several hundred thousand of them into Bangladesh. Yeah. Um, the dominant religion in Myanmar is Buddhism. Is right. it typical to have violence as a feature of Buddhism? Well, you know, I think that's a stereotype that we all have. 
there are some very violent monks in Burma. What's it called? The, is it the 360 movement or 966, something like that? They're very, very uh, violent in, in turn, especially with respect to Muslims, uh, the Rohingyas and other Muslims. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it, 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 and, and I, I uh, and the same has been true in Thailand, interestingly enough, much to my surprise, that in, during the Cold War, uh, there were some uh, very important monks in, in Thailand uh, who were espousing very, very violent rhetoric against uh, communists and other people that they didn't like. Yeah, interesting. Um, let's see. The, um, of the 134 ethnic groups, are they represented in Congress? Assuming they, they, I'm assuming they belong to perhaps they, they, the national. They certainly vote, and there are ethnic parties. Okay. Um, and uh, the National League for Democracy, I think, uh, cooperates with a number of those of those parties. Although in some places the NLD does not cooperate, but but uh, yes, there are parties. They vote. Uh, they although they're probably not allowed to vote in areas where the military is very active, perhaps. Okay. Um, what are the politics of the military? Are they leftist, fascist, communist? Any ideology you can identify? I don't think of them as, as being uh, ideological particularly, uh, except uh, they were quite anti-communist in, in earlier years. Uh, but I just think it's a matter of power. They want to stay in power. They want to retain their privileges. Um, and I think that's it. I, I certainly think they must know that they're not well loved. Interesting. Yeah, out of power, they have no money either. And that is uh, part of a question from Anne. Can you discuss the attempt of the military-controlled Central Bank of Myanmar, their attempt to withdraw a million dollars? Um, I think she means a million dollars or, or some amount from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Yeah, they have a lot of, they have that. I've read that, uh, that they have that money. And, and I think that, let's see, are they prohibited from that uh, already, or is that one of the things that could still be done? Uh, that was an issue in any case. Um, and uh, I, I think I think maybe they are prohibited from withdrawing that, but I'm not entirely sure whether they are. That was one of the things that was talked about as perhaps could happen. Yeah, that would be certainly a good place to have sanctions. Um, the What's the difficulty of a common person having to endure in a day-to-day -day situation today with the ongoing um, violence? Well, if they're, if they're involved in the resistance, of course, it's very scary because the military comes around at night and arrests people that they think are involved in the, in the military. Uh, the, uh, incidentally, that, that relates to back to the question of the internet and, and uh, the new technologies and so forth. The Burmese government has acquired, I mean, the Burmese military has acquired technologies uh, uh, from Americans, from Europeans, maybe from the Chinese, that allow them to sweep up all sorts of information about people, uh, sweep up uh, information from their cell phones, can identify where they are, you know, and that sort of thing. And uh, so that's very scary uh, if, if people are, are resisting. Uh, in terms of ordinary um, uh, life outside of all of this trouble, uh, Burma has uh, dramatically increased its level of, of um, economic success, so to speak, since the days when Ne Win drove the economy back into literally the dark ages. Burma had been a relatively prosperous Southeast Asian nation, uh, but uh, after Ne Win took over, they engaged in, in policies which, which uh, led to, you know, I, I was there in 1978 actually for my first time, you know, and it really looked like a pretty poor uh, country, you know, old, old automobiles and, and just and old stuff. And even, even later on, uh, the buses were very, very uh, old, but a, a lot of that has changed. And so if you're in an urban area, uh, you could, uh, I think, uh, I, I don't know the GDP of the country exactly, but I, I think uh, things, uh, you know, you could get along. But in the rural areas, uh, I, I think it is still quite, quite poor. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to let Lori Bergner have just a second. She has a, a note from her guide when she visited yeah. Myanmar. So I was there in um, uh, uh, 2013, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, and went to the border area that's so poor. And really, they're, they were still, and I think still are having what's considered a civil war there against the minorities there. 
in fact, the, the people send their children, I think they still are doing this, to monasteries to get away from the violence. Uh, yes, yes. So you see a lot of children in monasteries. So here's, um, so last night I talked to the guide that I had there and he's actually in a pretty far away from the city. So their community is doing okay, but he's so upset, obviously. My other guide that took us all around is, is actually on Facebook and trying to tell people what's going on and everyone mm -hmm. is like incredibly upset. So, but here's an interesting uh, thing that my guide sent. He said, my bad memory still remains in my village the year 1999, my father was against the military for land taxes. He had a, a, a rice plantation. He stood up and said, we are not agreed to your taxes. He said, people can't speak the Burmese language, but his father could during the confrontation. The mm -hmm. next day, my father was arrested at gunpoint and imprisoned for six months. Mm -hmm. My mom and I were very sad and desperate. I was in high school at that time. I had to bring two meals a day to the prison for my father because the food was so terrible. How can I feel when I hear my dad's words? An unacceptable situation. My dad got such mistreatment in prison. That's why we lost him so early. He died a couple of years ago and he wasn't very old. Since that time, I've decided in my mind to be against this military junta. They have gun in their hand. You need to have gun too. Otherwise they will not treat you as a human being. So to be a politician, I prefer to be a revolutionist. This time I will not get on the street, but I support the rations, food, and water for the protesters. So, yeah. Yeah, that Thanks, sounds Gloria. very realistic. Yeah. All right. So a couple more questions. We've got a few more minutes yet. Um, given the country's apparent embrace of Aung San Suu Kyi, how are women treated in the main? Are they allowed significant positions of authority? I also would like to add to that that I've been reading extensively about the role of women as they protest. Yes. Um, men are more likely to be put in prison, as Lori pointed out, um, but women are able to protest, but not free of violence either. They're more likely to be shot, I think. Yeah. There was a story in the New York Times just this morning, one of those big long stories about women uh, in, in, the, in the protest movements, and also generally about women in the, um, uh, in, in the society. And uh, it, the, the point of that story was essentially that women are absolutely vital to the protest movement. They're sort of taking the lead. Uh, and the military resents that because it is so male dominated uh, and they're getting shot. The first person to die was a woman. Um, and uh, so, um, and, and as the story pointed out, I think the, the society tends to be uh, male dominated, uh, the, Bur the, the hierarchy, of course, in the monkhood is, is male, although there are Burmese nuns, I mean, uh, Bur uh, not Burmese nuns, but Buddhist nuns. Um, on the other hand, uh, behind the scenes, women are thought to be fairly powerful in, in Burma. Uh, my uh, colleague at NIU, Therapy Thon, who is herself Burmese, has written a book about Burmese women, uh, which you might want to look up sometime if you care to, to, to um, you know, go into that in more detail. What is the title of that book? I don't remember the title offhand, but it's, it's her name is Therapy, T-H-A-R-P-H-I, and then Than, T-H-A-N. She's an historian, although she's in the Department of Languages and, and World Literature. Okay, thank you. I'll share that with everybody. Um, is Myanmar diplomatically isolated? Well, they're, they're, uh, they seem, uh, that's another thing I, I should have said, that's another thing the United States could do to try to isolate them even more. Uh, I don't know if that will be terribly effective uh, because as you pointed out, the, the, gen, the military person you quoted said something to the effect that, uh, well, we've been under sanctions before. Uh, under Jane, under Ne Win, they were isolated deliberately by themselves, self-isolated. Um, and uh, they managed to survive for 50 years of military rule in that way. Um, but um, uh, they're, uh, I don't know if they're generally isolated. They're isolated certainly in, uh, in countries like the United States and other countries which have criticized them. Uh, but uh, I presume they still have diplomatic recognition around the world and probably aren't isolated everywhere. I think this one for last because I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of a good way to frame it. But Bob Kapanji asked early on, is the notion a century ago of the white man's burden similar to today's system, systemic racism in Burma, Myanmar, 
Um, and I guess I'd like to ask, um, to add to that, does Burma reject outside pressure because they would like to resolve their issues on their own, even if it's not a very humane or, or diplomatic or kind way? I think there is an element of that. Um, sometimes outsiders are too quick to make judgments about you know, what's going on in Burma, although right now, uh, I, I don't know that we're making quick judgments because the Burmese themselves are obviously resisting the military. But uh, yeah, um, and maybe there was an element with Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, she became an icon. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi, I actually know her. Um, and, but, but there was almost a tendency to worship her as an icon, and then she turned politician. She defended the military's actions against the Rohingyas. She's lost a great deal of her luster. So maybe outsiders sometimes don't know enough about what's going on really to have, I mean, that's, that's, that's true with, uh, with, I suppose, every country. Uh, but uh, sometimes lecturing uh, the Burmese is, uh, is not a good thing. Right now, I, I think it is a good thing to, to uh, criticize the military when it's takeover. Yeah, there does seem to be um, a universal criticism of the military right now because of their um, horrific tactics of dealing with the protesters. Um, for men, back to the question of the, the role of women in Myanmar society, men may be wounded mortally, but wounded below the waist, and women are often shot in the head or through the yeah. chest. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, women aren't wounded in the protest. If women are shot, they are killed. So, yeah. um, so is did I see somebody's hand up who wanted to ask a question? Dewey, did you have a question today? If not, I've got another one. <laughs> so you had mentioned um, Aung San Suu Kyi and her um, recent kind of falling our loss of luster, we'll say. It's, it's terrible when we um, knock our idols off their pedestals. Um, and it turns out she's an actual person with uh, philosophies that may or may not be popular with everyone. But she has not defended the Rohingya. She has taken the position that you noted that, that most in Myanmar do not consider them an ethnic group. They're Bengalese. They belong in Bengal and they should be kicked out. Um, and she supported that position, um, which kind of led her to be less than iconic in the West. Um, but did that have the same effect on the people of Myanmar? Or did they agree with her on the position of how Myanmar's treating the Rohingya? You know, that's a fundamental question. I wish I knew fully the answer to that. Um, first of all, let me say that uh, while she, that, that, Aung San Suu Kyi is in charge of the government, but she doesn't control the military uh, and she doesn't control what they do again about the Rohingyas. The military does that. But on the other hand, she did go out of her way to, I guess it was to the international court to make mm -hmm. that statement of defense. And so I don't know. I mean, the, the best you can say is that she was waiting for this election of 2020 um, and then make changes, you know, and she didn't want to alienate the military too much prior to that time. But I don't know, she's a Burman. Uh, nobody likes the Rohingyas, basically. So maybe she shares those views. I just don't know whether she does or not. I, I should say uh, on that, though, I did talk with a person in Washington three or four years ago, probably, uh, who had been the former American Charge d'Affaires in Burma and who spoke with Aung San Suu Kyi and she said, Privately, you know, uh, the Rohingyas are the only people who do any work in Rakhine State, um, suggesting a sort of a positive view of the Rohingyas. So, uh, but I don't know. I wish I knew. I've raised that question myself with people. What does Aung San Suu Kyi really think about the, the Rohingyas? Huh. Nobody know. So, is this a, is the military coup uh, done, or is there any chance of it walking back? I just don't know. I mean, maybe the military will decide it's not worth it. And maybe they will 
revert to their privileges they already have, which are quite extensive, but I wouldn't count on it, you know, based on their past history. They could have a real blood bloodbath blood here and uh, they could rule for some time. Yeah. Um, I think, have I missed any questions? I don't, I don't think so. Um, and so with that, I think we've come to the end of a very thought-provoking conversation about Myanmar and uh, the horrific violence that's going on there as a result of the military coup. Um, when I titled this program, I called it a military um, coup redux. <laughs> so um, it's, it's the same all over again, but different. <laughs> but, and so we'll see what's happening in Myanmar and, and we'll pay attention to what's going on because when a country undertakes the program of killing its own citizens, it makes the rest of the world quite nervous. So with that, thank you, Dr. Clymer. Um, it's been a pleasure to get to know you and to hear from you today. For the, if you are not a member of the Peoria Area World Affairs Council, please become a member at www.paywac.org. And don't forget next week, we have a program on othering the human side of the pandemic, what happens when we create a new class of untouchables and the book drive on March 20. And our big program with Dr. Neil Barnard, uh, change your diet, change the world one bite at a time on March 18th. That is a webinar and you should have received that link in your newsletter. And so make sure that you register for that and we'll have a terrific program. And unless somebody has um, something else, I'd like to wish everybody a wonderful weekend. Please enjoy the warmer weather. Even if we do get a little rain, it's still going to be warmer and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. Thanks, Professor.